spring 1942. The Axis was winning the war, and the Allies faced their gravest crisis as Nazi and Japanese officers met in Germany. If their victory is continued, and as yet there was no force to stop them, the Axis powers hoped their armies would victoriously meet in Asia, just as their tacticians met for maneuvers. Each greedy for immediate conquests, they planned to completely dominate the world. In those black days of 1942, German armies and air forces pushed toward Japan. Relentlessly, the gigantic Axis pincers were threatening to close in Central Asia. That's why American industry doubled and quadrupled its war effort. There was definite hope for victory, provided the British and Russian people could give the United States time to supply our allies and time to build an air force which could smash the Axis pincers. It wasn't long when the Truman Committee was able to state we have succeeded in building up an air industry in the U.S. which our foes cannot hope to equal. But planes alone were not enough, and so specialized training began in 1942 under the watchful eye of Secretary of War Henry Stimson. He saw the 82nd Airborne Flying Foot Soldiers change from a brave dream into a deadly fighting machine under command of General Matthew Ridgway. The first air troop carrier unit had been set up by the AAF to work with paratroopers. The amazing success of the Germans had awakened belated American interest in vertical envelopment, which means landing a combat force behind enemy lines. Reliable C-47s were quickly boarded by the shock troops who were going to spearhead the way for a glider army which would follow. They were about to test tactical principles in North Carolina before going overseas to help blunt the Axis tensors. For all the great airborne operations of the war, American troop carrier men and planes provided most of the lift. There was nothing new about an airborne army. Billy Mitchell had received approval for such an operation during World War I. But even he never dreamed of entire armies filling the skies. In theory, the American paratroopers dropped on surprise defenders and seized bridgeheads for the gliders. On other airfields, tow craft, modified C-47 sky trains, hitched on troop carrier gliders which were loaded and ready. Nylon, the new strong synthetic, was science's answer to the tow rope problem. Once hooked together, the transport towed the glider into position for the takeoff run. This made room for another sky train. On a split second schedule, they were like so many locomotives taking on freight cars. Some sky trains hauled double freights. Taxiing at full throttle, the tow planes had to remain on the ground until the ton and a half gliders were airborne. Once over the drop zone, glider pilots cut their ships loose to play their special part in the pattern of attack. Banking sharply away, they dove for the ground. Quickest possible landing kept the unarmed gliders from being easy game for enemy fighters. As more cut loose and headed down to the spinning earth, the glider army joined the paratroopers who had set up points of resistance. Thus, the AAF gave the infantry wing, and the weapon, vertical envelopment, became a reality. Another weapon in America's arsenal for global war was the skill and experience of our great commercial airlines operating under contract to the War Department. July 1942, this ferrying service was reorganized as the Air Transport Command under veteran flyer General Harold George. In the company of C.R. Smith, his deputy, they inspected new installations. By summer, ATC routes touched all six continents. The growth of the Air Transport Command closely paralleled the expansion of the Air Force itself. In less than two years, sky bridges connected practically every corner of the world. ATC sky wagons, guided by the Army Airways communication system, crossed the Atlantic on an average of one every 13 minutes. The broader Pacific, 
every hour and a half. And so ATC, by supplying both men and machines to world battlefronts, was preparing to smash the Axis threat. During these critical early days, the Navy succeeded in breaking the Japanese secret code. On May 15th, Navy intelligence officers intercepted an important communication. It was the detailed Jap plan to attack Midway and points in the Aleutians with an invasion army supported by a tremendous task force. But if the Japs knew that we had broken their code, this could have been a wild goose chase or a trap. The Army and Navy decided to gamble. If we could intercept the Jap Navy at Midway, the payoff was too great to overlook. And so the call went out. ATC had to deliver reinforcements, bombs and ammunition to the Aleutians and B-17s to Midway. The Hawaiian department had to beg, borrow, and steal these bomber aircraft from our slim Pacific forces. The B-17s committed to this mission were led by Lieutenant Colonels Walter Sweeney and Brooke Allen. Every last plane would be needed for the impending battle. Once down on Midway after the long flight, with no rest, our crews had to be thrown into immediate patrol. The Japanese fleet, more than 80 warships, advanced. The coded message was authentic. Their task forces divided, some steaming north toward Alaska, the main body converging on Midway. 470 miles west of the island, the battle stage was set when a Navy Catalina spotted the strong enemy task force. But Midway's commander refused to commit American naval or air units until he had more information about the enemy. Our newly arrived B-17s and B-26s, as well as Marine fighters, were under constant alert. We installed extra gas tanks to increase bomber range. Our crewmen realized that this was going to be the first test of B-17s as a defensive weapon against attacking surface forces. Some big bomber boys even claimed that B-17s could stop carriers. The 4th of June was the day of the real battle. Minutes after a patrol sighted the enemy, those bombers not yet in the air got going fast. Nine B-17 crews under Colonel Sweeney were joined by five from Colonel Allen's squad. Warmed up and ready for battle, Air Force bombers took off to find the enemy. Island, from where our bombers were to proceed west to the target. 100 miles out, our bomber commanders received new orders to change course and go after an enemy carrier force that had broken away from the main fleet and was now launching an attack against our base. The Japanese dagger pointed at Midway was made up of four carriers, great battle wagons, many destroyers and transports. The mission of the Imperial carrier planes was to rake the island's gun emplacements and bomb the way for an invasion. Marine Vindicators sprang to meet the enemy and the battle was on. battle, our flag was struck down. Marines quickly repaired the broken staff and ceremoniously raised old glory against the backdrop of fire, smoke, and fate. Units of the U.S. Navy, including three flat tops, had raced up to Midway. Navy fighters and bombers were wound up and sent off while the Japs were still pounding U.S. defenses. Enemy destroyers and cruisers were the target. Our marauders and fortresses went after enemy carriers. 
Jap units were like huge magnets attracting Navy planes, Marine dive bombers, and AAF heavies. One B-17 found his target and leveled off. units and American bombers joined the battle. This Jap Betty got through our barrage. It was a free-for-all. Finally, when our Navy and Air Force bombers hammered back at Jap carriers, the issue was decided. First, our bombers attacked from 3,600 feet and then came down to strafe the deck. One by one, the enemy ships caught fire. During the three-day battle, aside from eight auxiliary vessels sunk or damaged, Japan lost four carriers, two heavy cruisers, and three destroyers, in addition to 275 aircraft and 4,800 men. We had smashed the Jap dagger. Back at the base, now free from the threat of invasion, the men dug themselves out of the wreckage. A Navy PBY, which had rescued a ditched B-17 crew, now brought them home. The battle ended with Midway's installations, including the hospital, badly wrecked by enemy bombers. Unified under one flag, sailors, marines, and airmen who had fought side by side now saluted the 92 officers and 215 enlisted men we had lost. All were heroes. In the Battle of Midway, perhaps the most important single engagement of the Pacific Naval War, the airplane at last proved itself a defensive weapon against attacking surface forces. Once again, the AAF had demonstrated its ability to meet the enemy on land, on sea, and in the air. It was planned destiny that the Axis pincers would suffer the crushing blows of the greatest striking force in military history, the United States Air Force. June 1942, New York Harbor. Men of the 8th Air Force, 10,000 strong, prepared to board a single converted luxury liner for England, just as their fathers did a generation before in the AEF Aero Squadrons. This time, the 97th Bomb Group ground crews, two fighter groups and their service units were embarking for England. On her maiden troop ship run across the Atlantic, the Queen Elizabeth carried the vanguard of American air power for the new fight against aggression. In England, at High Wycombe, we used a girls' boarding school as headquarters. Here, 30 miles from Piccadilly, began the build-up, which eventually made the 8th Air Force larger than the entire U.S. Army had been only three years before. As the summer of 1942 rushed by, the work of Generals Duncan, Aker, Spots, and the rest of us made the idea a reality. We learned about the air war from the RAF reaching a degree of cooperation never before equaled by the military forces of two great nations. However, for smashing target Germany, there was disagreement on tactics. The AAF came over prepared for daylight precision bombing, although the British now practice night area bombing, having suffered unbearably heavy losses in daylight operations. Accordingly, the British Bomber Command picked their targets, trained their crews, fed them lots of carrots, and designed their planes for deadly night attacks. The success of the Wellingtons and Lancasters in attacks against Cologne and the Ruhr during the summer nights of 1942 offered grim evidence of what such tactics could accomplish. These free men were dedicating their lives to attempt the destruction of the economic fabric of an enemy nation in order to save our way of life. 
Our first test in tactics came August 17th. It was a critical day for the 8th Bomber Command when we loaded up for the first U.S. raid from England in U.S. planes in daylight. General Ira Aker had told us that the target was the great marshalling yard near Rouen in Nazi-occupied France. There were still plenty of skeptics who predicted dismal results from the first attempt at a daylight mission. General Spots and Aker had to prove them wrong. Our morale had worn pretty thin from repeated dry runs and public impatience for American action in the European theater. Each guy acted nonchalant, but we were fully aware of the long-range strategic planning that hinged on this particular mission. Maybe we didn't know any better, but we had plenty of confidence. Confidence in our weapons. Confidence in our buddies and the way they did their job. We didn't think of ourselves as heroes, just hot rocks. But heroes or not, the flying privates, sergeants, and generals were putting their lives on the line, knowing full well what the odds were. At the controls of one of the lead ships was the old man himself, General Aker flying a B-17, which someone aptly named Yankee Doodle. As the bombers pulled up their gear, American flyers and 12 American machines assembled over the British countryside, ready to test an American idea in France. High altitude, precision bombing. As England disappeared behind us, we took up battle stations. Our bombardiers and gunners knew that the fate of the mission and the lives of the crew depended on them. We took turns manning the guns, expecting opposition. One of the crew pointed out the city of Rouen, where Joan of Arc had died for the liberation of France. Now, airplanes named Baby Doll, Peggy D, and Yankee Doodle were spoiling the fight for the same thing. German warning centers, caught by surprise, didn't report the fortresses until they were well on their way to the target. We made a direct run for a point about three miles north of Rouen, and then a slight turn to the right for the bombing approach. All of us flying this first U.S. bomber raid wondered why the sky was clear of enemy fighters and flak. Visibility was excellent, something you don't get for night bombing. All 12 planes dropped a total of 37,000 pounds of bombs. Then we met Flack. Daylight gave the Jerry's better targets, too. They pumped anti-aircraft shells smack up to our altitude. planes collected some flak. Then 40 German fighters made the picture complete. These were no tow targets. These babies throw lead back at you. When we finally shook off the enemy attack, I took a reading. Our group was intact. The mission was far more successful than many of us had dared hope. Even British Bomber Command, Air Chief Marshal Harris, sent General Aker enthusiastic congratulations. Yankee Doodle, he said, certainly went to town and can stick another well-deserved feather in his cap. One month later, halfway around the world, events in New Guinea took charge of plans. The Japanese drive toward Port Moresby, one of the few bases we still held north of Australia, threatened to push the Allies into the sea. To stop the enemy, General MacArthur quickly reset the stage for an Allied offensive. He relied on General George Kenney, new commander of Allied Air, who is reorganizing the 5th Air Force with fresh spirit and ideas. The urgency of the situation led him to a daring experiment in air tactics. Moving an army by air had worked in the Carolina maneuvers. Why not in New Guinea? 
MacArthur had ordered troops rushed into battle. One regiment took 36 hours to go by water. A battalion took five weeks by foot, but 60 planes carried an entire Australian infantry battalion in one day. In a little more than an hour, fresh and rested troops arrived in combat zones, ready for immediate duty in the Papuan campaign. With the troops came equipment. By mid-November, 10,000 American and Australian troops had been carried over the mountains. To support the men, air transport brought in supplies at the rate of two million pounds a week. They eventually brought in enough men, rations, ammunition, artillery, and equipment to feed and protect themselves, do battle with the enemy, and build airfields. Specially designed airborne equipment, such as pint-sized bulldozers and graders, helped us lay out six airstrips in the Kunai Flats. Without native labor, paid at local union rates, the work of building grass strips could never have been accomplished. Around Dabadura, they scraped out runways less than 16 miles from the front. Construction completed, fighter units moved in fast to protect the operation. And so the Southwest Pacific Air Forces, directed by veteran air leader George Kenney and fighter commander Ennis Whitehead, had forged a tactical weapon which helped stem the tide of Japanese aggression in the Papuan campaign. The one airplane we fighter pilots in New Guinea wanted was the P-38. We had begged Washington to spare us a few of these high-flying speedy lightnings. When we finally got them, the ground crews had a big job on their hands. Fuel tanks, superchargers, armament, all required major adjustment or repair. Enemy mechanics on neighboring fields had fewer planes than the Allies, but numbers in the South Pacific didn't tell everything. Back in October, General Kenny had warned the Pentagon, the Jap is two days from the factory to the combat zone, and he may swarm all over me. On December 27th, the Jap tried. About 11.30 hours, they gave us the alert. Fort Moresby had received the word that our radio station at Dabadura had picked up a plot of enemy aircraft approaching the Buna area. We pilots had waited a long time for this moment, and with the help of our crew chief, we got going in a hurry. It had taken more than three months to get the P-38s ready for combat. Our maintenance boys had worked hard, and now we were about to put the lightnings to the test. As part of the 39th Fighter Squadron, we had flown some patrol and escort missions. However, this was to be our first important combat operation. Twelve brand new P-38s were being dispatched to intercept an invading force of unknown strength. Both sides were in for a surprise. At 12.10 hours, we sighted the Japs. They were out in force. Separating into three flights of four each, we got on top at 10,000 feet. The Zeros didn't appreciate the view. Our lead flight peeled off to dive in and break up the formation. With his throttle wide open, this P-38 jockey latched onto a jet. Then the first lightning struck. One of the eager beavers in action that day was a moon-faced lieutenant by the name of Richard Fogg. This was the first of Fogg's 40 victories. Captain Thomas Lynch was also there, and that was a good thing because the enemy force included more than 28 zeros and bombers. Tommy Lynch got two more that day, making him the 39th Squadron's first ace.
When the score was finally added up, our 12 Lightnings had shot down 11 enemy fighters and bombers. Thus, the P-38 made a dramatic debut in the Southwest Pacific. The tide was turning, but one battle didn't win a war. There were still brutal weeks and months and years of war ahead. Later chapters will show that the enemy had not yet seen, felt, nor imagined the awful night of the air power to be unleashed by the United States Air Force. Oh.